Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon from Manila. Good evening or good morning to those of you joining us from other parts of the world. Thank you very much for joining this Knowledge Lab session on promoting women leadership in technology through innovation in higher education and technical and vocational education and training, or TVET, organized by the ADB Education Sector Group. I'm Mitzi Borromeo, your moderator today. I've worked in popular education for over two decades as a media and communication specialist and broadcast journalist. And I've covered a lot of stories related to gender equality. And this is certainly something that requires more media attention to get more media, uh, well, to get more discussions going this. In fact, different fora. Uh, so the forums like this are very important indeed. In my current work on Mind School TV, which is a family education show about how things are connected across the sciences and arts, we explore life sciences through the intersection of science, technology, and innovation. And we also look at how they can address the impacts of climate change, increase, uh, increase food security, improve healthcare, protect our biodiversity, and manage our limited natural resources. And we recognize that girls and women play a key role in crafting solutions for such issues to achieve the sustainable development goals. So I'm very excited to learn from our amazing panel about their experiences and learnings on nurturing the greatest untapped population, women and girls, to become the next generation of STEM professionals and to be tech leaders. Investing in their talent is an investment in human rights, inclusion, and sustainable development. With the expanding impact of the fourth industrial revolution, societies across the globe are experiencing an era of digital revolution. And technology is shape, reshaping the world of work with automation, artificial intelligence, and robotics increasingly being integrated into workplaces. Such technological transition helps us move forward into the future, but it may also have a negative impact on workers who could increasingly be replaced by these technologies with women expected to be more disproportionately affected than men due to their lack of skills and knowledge in STEM and digital fields. So in this session, we've gathered a brilliant panel to explore how higher education and uh, technical and vocational education and training or TVET empower and prepare women to lead technology innovation and to adapt to new and emerging skills and jobs as projected by various labor market analyses. To tell us more, allow me to introduce Brajesh Panth, the Chief of Education Sector Group at the Asian Development Bank to deliver the welcome remarks. Thank you, uh, Michi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. It is a great pleasure to welcome you all to this important session on promoting women leadership in technology. ADB's education vision is to ensure learning for all with a particular focus on girls and women and disadvantaged groups this vision is aligned with SDG 4 and priorities of our developing member countries. However, 50% of the world's out-of-school population are still in the Asia and Pacific region, and 74% of the region's out-of-school children are in South Asia. Around 16 million primary and 34 million secondary school age children are out of school, and 48% of girls are attending secondary schools. Children. Uh, Children and young people uh, from rural areas and low-income families are at a disadvantage of accessing and benefiting fully from education. Therefore, a full 12-year education is a still uh, distant dream for many countries. COVID-19 has exacerbated learning and inequities. We are very concerned that many adolescent girls may drop out. The fourth industrial revolution, as pointed out by Mitzi or IR 4.0, along with acceleration of digitalization is transforming skills and occupations. Occupations related to digital skills are increasing rapidly, but we see a serious gender imbalance in STEM education, although STEM related occupations are expanding. Women are also engaged disproportionately in uh, informal jobs like in agriculture. All this limits the potential to enhance economic opportunities and sustainable growth of countries. But turning these constraints into an opportunity by tapping on digital transformation can empower women with critical skills to leapfrog and help close existing gender gaps. This will particularly require ensuring that everyone is able to acquire at least good quality education up to the secondary level with a particular focus on girls uh, and disadvantaged groups to facilitate school to work transition and or continued education in post-secondary Tibet and universities. This also requires partnering with the private sector and employers to provide 
role models and make education more practically oriented and relevant to emerging skills and jobs for women. Finally, it also requires comprehensive policy response. For example, McKinsey's 2015 report on power of parity looked at four categories covering 15 indicators, uh, equality in work, essential services and enablers of economic opportunity, legal protection and political voice, physical security and autonomy. This session includes highly experienced champions and leaders that bring different dimensions on how Tibet and universities can support women leadership, particularly in digital technology. Today's keynote speaker and panelists will provide inspiration and specific examples of good practices on how to empower women. This in turn will also provide lessons for policy reforms to redress the current imbalance and contribute to inclusive and sustainable development. Thank you again for your participation. Let me thank Samantha Hung, Chief of Gender Equality Thematic Group and her team for inviting us. Let me also thank Mikim Shin, uh, Education Specialist for preparing the concept and suggesting the speakers and moderator for this session with inputs from various colleagues. And thank you, Mitzi, for moderating this session. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Pant. It is my pleasure to be moderating this. I always learn so much from these discussions. And thank you for organizing this very important discussion. So very much looking forward to it. As you said, COVID-19 has exacerbated a lot of inequality. So you've set the scene clearly for us. We'll be discussing all those topics that you mentioned in uh, our panel discussion later on. Now let's welcome our keynote speaker, Yun Kung Chang, president of Suk Myung Women's University, where she is dedicated to developing the Institute as a prestigious women's university, leading the future on the global stage. Thank you, Michi. I'm honored that the Asian Development Bank invited me to participate in this important conversation on gender equality in Asia and Pacific. This conversation is more urgent than ever. Uh, in the 20 years before the COVID-19 pandemic, we made a significant progress to address key challenges to closing the gender gap. But as many of you know, the pandemic has set us back by introducing new challenges and amplifying old challenges. So while we make plans for how to come out of the pandemic, we need to recalibrate our strategy for gender equality. One area that we can focus on is to access to education and continuing education for women and girls in the APEC region. You may be familiar with the statistic that 129 million girls do not go to school. But that figure was before the pandemic and now an additional 11 million girls may not return to school after the pandemic. Researchers are considering the different uh, reasons for this. Even before the pandemic, girls in the primary school age group spend 40% more time doing household work than boys. And women in Asia and the Pacific spend four times more time than men on unpaid care work, including direct personal care and household work. The pandemic is making this gap wider and household and care work, which were already falling heavily on women and girls before the pandemic, increased significantly during the pandemic with more family members becoming ill and more children staying home and requiring care during the business hours. This means that those women and girls now have even less time for paid work and school than they did before and other women and girls who previously did have opportunities for paid work in school, for example, women entrepreneurs, are now dividing their time or completely shifting their time to home and caregiving. There are various angles to try to address these inequalities. One immediate challenge created during the pandemic is that all the problem of access to learning took on a new form of access to remote learning. After schools physically closed, 222 million girls could not attend school simply because they did not have access to the technology for remote schooling. 
This is an example of how issues relating to access to technology are now critical for access to education. And access to technology has a hidden issue. Not only we need internet, laptops, and mobile devices, but we also need digital literacy that supports the use of technology. At Sungmyo Women's University, as we started to meet these challenges, first through the Asia Pacific Women's Information Network Center, we switched from face-to-face -face programming to online ICT training across the APEC region. And local universities and schools are now serving as access hubs to provide the internet and technology needed for women and girls to engage. Second, at Sungmyung, we have transformed the university library so students can rent laptops through self-service kiosks, use high-speed internet, and get private, quiet study spaces to participate in the lectures and complete their coursework. Third, Sungmyung is collaborating with tech and telecommunication company to develop a metaverse where students can learn practical skills and interact on a virtual university campus. These are just a few examples. And through this gender forum, I look forward to hearing what all of you have considered from the private and public sectors at work and at school and in, many, in the many countries represented here as we continue to pursue gender equality. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chang. Excellent examples there. It's wonderful seeing this virtual university. Thank you for sharing that and the inspiration uh, through your example. As you said, um, there have been many setbacks from the pandemic. And I like what you said about there being a need for recalibration, uh, for uh, looking at the strategies we need to look into for gender equality, because we really have to reimagine uh, re the post-pandemic world and how we can build a better, more inclusive world. So all of that will be discussed further uh, in our panel discussion later. So definitely we have to encourage more women to actively participate in technology development. Now we move on to our panel discussion. Each of our panelists will have eight minutes to talk about their topics. I will be asking them one question after each of their presentations before we bring in questions from you, the audience. So as you listen to the presentations, may I ask you to note down your questions or your thoughts, and you can write these into the chat box and I will bring them up uh, during the open question and answer forum at the end of this panel discussion. Please do write your questions in the chat box with your name uh, and your institution and who the question is addressed to. And if for some reason we lack time, which always happens in these forums, uh, please do send your question to adb underscore gender at adb.org with the name of the session that your question refers to. I will write that email address again in the chat box so you can note that down. Now let's begin with Wirastuti Widyatmanti. Dr. Widyatmanti is the head of the vision for academic innovation in Universitas Gad. You're on mute. Oh, sorry. Sorry, I was on mute apparently. I'm sorry about that. I thought I had unmuted myself. I'm sorry. Um, I was just saying, I hope, sorry. So I had said earlier that um, I was just commenting on Dr. Chang's uh, very uh, inspiring example there at their university. And uh, I liked her idea on recalibrating, the need for us to recalibrate our strategy to include uh, gender equality in our uh, approaches forward as we reimagine a better world, a better post pandemic world. So we move on now to our panel discussion, where each of our panelists will have eight minutes to talk about their topics. I will ask them a question after each of their, after each of their presentations before we bring in questions from the audience. So may I remind all of you to please note down your questions or your comments, and you may, you may write them into the chat box. Please do add your name and your institution and uh, who the question is addressed to, and we will try to accommodate as many questions as possible. And if we do run out of time, may we ask you to please send your questions that may be unanswered to adb underscore gender at adb.org with the name of the session that your question refers to. I will write down that email address in the chat box so you can note that down. All right, let's move on. Let's begin our, our presentations now with Wirastuti with Yatmanti. 
Dr. Widyat Manti is the head of Division for Academic Innovation in Universitas Gajamada or UGM in Indonesia and has run various projects to support female students. She is also a lecturer and researcher at the Department of Geographical Information Science, Faculty of Geography in UGM. She'll talk to us about how to arm the female workforce with higher level skills for emerging jobs and how universities can support students to increase employability. Well, thank you so much, Misi, for uh, the time that has shared to me. Well, it's my honor to have opportunity to share our challenge, problem solving experience, and also hope and dreams uh, that related to women opportunity to assess the digital skill in higher education, especially in Indonesia. So in, uh, we, I will share about the problem that we already uh, face. Uh, I think it's not only Indonesia, but also uh, the country around the world that the female percentage of female employment in Indonesia was reported at 17 of 08% in 2020. And our only 20% of female working in technology company are uh, had uh, that uh, female employment. And in fact, the overall ratio of the number of female workers to the total workforce returned to 2%. So this uh, number, I think, uh, has to be concerned and this condition must be addressed immediately because the same research states that the presence of women can increase innovation, agility, and also company financial performance. And um, this uh, statement and also this data actually have been responded by the government, uh, stated for... Uh, stated from and in several occasions, is national or internationally, uh, through our president Joko Widodo, that really support uh, women and especially uh, potential strategies for women empowerment to always uh, consider the aspect to empower women. And this woman empowerment is really on required cooperation among related stakeholders. So this is the emphasize, uh, this is the embassement uh, that uh, all level of government from national and local uh, that need to concern because the problem of the woman employment in Indonesia, especially involving uh, the generation, a young generation uh, in higher education that related to the IT is still lack of number. And from the emphasized uh, statement by the president of Jokowi, the Ministry of uh, uh, Communication has uh, developed some program that involve, uh, involving a lot of um, women empowerment program, especially in introducing how uh, women can actually learn uh, technology and also programming uh, as part as their daily uh, business and also work in uh, their daily routine. So uh, one of the program that uh, just uh, had um, just uh, conducted uh, this year is the programming with Python Ministry of Communication uh, and Information. And also it's uh, conducted uh, uh, through all universities in Indonesia, even though the participant comparing with the number of university is not yet uh, large, but 400 uh, participants this year is really a big number, considering that uh, IT for our female student is not yet uh, very familiar or popular uh, in case or in terms of opportunity. And uh, hopefully next year, we are uh, the ministry expect uh, to have like more than 1,000 uh, students uh, in higher university to involve is this uh, woman empowerment program in uh, tech training. And UGM is one of the committee to run this program. And uh, we expect that the network that we have for um, uh, offer Indonesia can develop this program in uh, the smooth way. So we can involve more students, not only in the urban area, but also the area that are so remote from the capital city of Indonesia. And, and from that program, we also uh, differentiate that and we try to develop another program uh, in, in University of Gajamada. And we translate that into the course called Development of Digital Transportation. We learn together how to uh, do the planning uh, course and also try to arrange the digital transformation course and et cetera, and the oral curriculum that related to in the very basic information 
that can assess by student who hasn't have uh, IT background. And from this program, we uh, also try to implement it uh, in every aspect, especially for student community empowerment learning. When we send our student to all of our area in Indonesia, especially in the remote area and also the underrepresented uh, area. So they can also promote the education that related to the technology information among the community, especially for our women and the village. And especially because most of the women in the village actually, they also have the smartphone, but uh, they, know, they don't know how to use it optimally to support uh, their need on the daily life. So we um, give the education for our training to the student before we send them to the remote area especially that related to the you know, technology information. And then we also uh, create the program to uh, develop a curriculum under a micro uh, development course that are related to the ICT and also leadership. So we uh, educate the teachers from primary, from the middle, and also from the secondary school. And we ask them and we have discussed and we work together to create the curricula that related to the IT which part, uh, which uh, other uh, factor or other element that they need to introduce the student, especially for a female student in the uh, the remote area, of course, and also for the uh, the early childhood uh, education also. And uh, also we develop the program that relates to the SDGs. And the last but the least, we, uh, UGM has been fully supported uh, by the program called UNESCO uh, Unit Twin Online Training that has been uh, collaborated together and, uh, in the last two years. And I think uh, the last one is really successful when we have 105 students who are already involved in this and they are feel excited about this and they really want to learn more and implementing in the, in the field that they uh, already uh, work on it. And this is some like the future planning uh, that we want to develop, especially uh, how to develop networking uh, related to ICT to uh, empower women in every area in Indonesia, uh, especially when the facility of the, I, uh, the IT or information technology is not yet provided well. So I think that is the first thing that we have to uh, uh, develop in Indonesia, like providing facility that can be assessed by community and remote area. And uh, at the end, after I'm closing this uh, presentation, there will be a testimony by uh, one of the participants of the UNESCO Unit Twin Training Program, uh, Siti Amalia, who will uh, share the experience and, and how is uh, the feeling of her joining the training. So uh, I pass uh, the time to Siti to share your testimony. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you very much. Yes, I participated in this ICD and leadership program because I was solely interested in to learn more about what it takes to be a leader and what kinds of abilities a leader needs to have. Aside from that, I was also interested to imp in improving my um, ICD skills since IT is the most developing field within this area. Within our ICD courses, um, the professors always further elaborated each technical terms that we may not understand because most of the participants were not familiar with ICD like me. And so it was a very great opportunity to learn together. Despite the fact that this training was held online, the courses were held very interactively, so we understand what the professors were trying to deliver and teach. I believe all participants feel the same and got the same benefits as well, and so I believe that this program could be an annual training program for students, especially women, to get the same benefits and, and such, insights, which could uh, drive their vision further than before. And this training, I also became more aware of what is currently happening to other women out there who are still experiencing discrimination within their work field or even in the household. And I learned how big the gender gap is in some countries and so forth. And so I believe by training them, um, this could be a real start to come up with solutions together. And this could lead to women being less vulnerable to these issues in the future and contribute more to drive economic growth, therefore reaching closely to gender equality. That is all from me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Siti. So I think uh, that's, us, uh, that's it for us, Vicky. Like, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Widyat Manti and Siti Amalio for that. Um, thank you, Dr. Widyat Manti, for sharing your university's excellent and very inspiring women empowerment programs. And we got to understand it even more through Siti 
through Siti Amalia's experience. Uh, how inspiring and how wonderful if all women in Asia could experience this. In fact, all women all over the world could have that. And I wish I had that when I was younger. <laughs> it's wonderful that this crisis is also presenting so many opportunities. So congratulations on those programs. And it is such an exciting time because I, like you said, there will be 1,000 students next year. So this number is sure to grow. This is a great way to, to build up the future um, of women. So my question for you is uh, right now is related to, to government hesitation to invest in higher education. We all know this is a big problem in developing countries, especially. Many countries don't provide secondary education for many girls. Do you think that government support for higher education as well as primary and secondary education is crucial? And why do you think it's important for government to consider women's higher education in the tech sector? All right. Well, I think uh, that's important uh, point that we have to emphasize that the opportunity of the access to IT is not only available for higher education, a female a student, but also for uh, the primary and secondary. Because uh, for to be a good programming or a good expert is in IT, we have to learn that from the very early uh, age of our education. Like uh, most of the students in university experiencing a uh, you know, like uh, coding, like difficulties to understand like, the programming because they're not knowing about this uh, knowledge earlier. So, but I believe that uh, all the female students are really tough and they really work hard, even though maybe it's considered too late to learn about the IT on the university level, but you know, like uh, they can uh, share that from a different perspective, like motivation and encouragement to uh, all the, maybe the, uh, um, the teachers in the secondary and the primary that this is important for the, uh, for the girls and the primary and the secondary that you have to learn this because the future of the world is really in your hand. Like the future of our generation is really uh, depending on your knowledge. So, and IT is one part of the important knowledge that, uh, uh, I think mom and also uh, woman uh, need to know uh, for uh, very uh, detail and also for the future planning of their, uh, what is it, uh, their dream and their hope. I think that's my uh, opinion. Yes, thank you. So definitely something worth investing in. We really need much more support for this from government. Yes, and it is. Yeah, right. So you think, for, and also, and we'll be hearing later more about uh, the need for collaboration also between the public and private sector. Thank you, Dr. Wilid Manti. Right. We'll be hearing from you again later. All, All right, right now, you. now let's hear from Camilla Morsh, Director of Education and English for the Americas region at the British Council. Before the British Council, Dr. Morsh supported organizations with programs related to social development, gender, and racial justice. She will talk about the British Council's educational for women researchers and high-skilled workers through scholarship for women in STEM. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for the ADB for the invitation. We are thrilled to be here. Thank you specifically for the ADB to be tackling this issue, which is absolutely very close to my heart personally, but also something that the British Council is really working um, towards contributing to. So let me just I am having problems to move my presentation, so I'm not able to, to move it. So maybe someone can support me. me I'll share for you. Okay, I'll stop sharing, then if you could please share, thank you. Just give a minute to Joey for her to start sharing. There we go. Great. So please, if you could go to slide three. Next one. Wonderful. So we have a wider women in science program. Uh, I will be talking about our wonderful STEM scholarships for women at the British Council. But I wanted just to take a moment to just set the scene a bit why we have this particular wider umbrella, which is our women in science program. Absolutely, we've heard quite, you know, quite many numbers and we know this, that we require a global approach to a global challenge. Next, please. And that's because there are several things we know we, we need to sort out. So if you think about women now make up a fraction of the workforce and research um, teams in STEM, you can see 29% of the world's researchers are, are, are women. You'll see that there are differences, there are differences between regions but still a very stark problem. Next, please. Now, 
a typical STEM worker earns about two thirds more than non-STEM workers, according to the Pew Research Center. This is just an example of how it is important to give women the opportunity to actually in, be inserted into this field and then take advantage. Otherwise, we would be reproducing one of the very important structural gaps, which is the gender pay gap around the world. Next, please. And gender parity in science, we believe, would be a major contribution to the achievement of SDG 5 and, and contribute to wider global challenges. Please, next. Now, I'll, I'll take a minute here because I think now we start with very interesting data. So this is the situation in Latin America. I'm currently the education director for the British Council based in Mexico City. 3, 3 a.m. here and very excited to, to be here. And that's why I'm going to explore a bit the, the situation in Latin America and then compare with the situation in Asia. So if you think at the aggregate, look, 2011, we spiked, we had a quite a bit of spike in the numbers of female researchers in LAC, Latin America and in, in the Caribbean. And then we plateaued a bit at a 45%. That's quite a, a remarkable number. So it's considered to be a region that has advanced and there is quite a bit of, um, of best practice to share. Next. There is nuance, of course, a lot of nuance when you compare particular countries. You see big country like Mexico, quite at the bottom of the list. That, and and I, we believe that focusing on big countries with big populations can also help us catalyze the movements and actually showcase better best practice. So for example, in our programs, we have a focus in the region in, in Brazil and Mexico, and that's quite an, an important data set for us. Next, please. And I'll, uh, next, I'll, I'll just take the, the next one. So I think this one is perhaps one of the most important uh, slides, especially if you think about everything that we've been talking um, on leadership. This is, con this is called the leaky pipeline. So if you, if you look, the, the blue line, this is the male line. And if, if you look, when you go to undergraduate studies and graduate studies, women are better off or a little bit worse off than men. But then as you go up the latter in terms of particular leadership, leadership positions, look as, as the gap widens. It widens tremendously to the point that we have 0%, pretty much 0% of representation in more senior positions for education fields and for positions that will be critical for STEM education and STEM careers. Please, next. Now, the situation in Asia is a bit different. Remember the aggregate number for Latin America and the Caribbean, 45%. Now, you see the aggregate number for, for Asia is quite remarkably lower. And I think there are reasons for that. We're still in the British Council, the Asian region in the British Council is looking very closely. There are several scoping studies in our programs around women in science to trying to understand why that, that is particularly remarkably low in, in, in the Asian region. Next, please. Some nuance again, if you look at particular countries, you also have a big country like India at the bottom, not totally at the bottom, but quite low. And then Myanmar topping up the charts here. And if you go to the next line, um, there is a little bit of replication of that particular national trend. And next. So of course, we know there are several barriers that we need to look at and gender stereotypes and biases. So the, the social constructions that really cast women in a particular place in society, and those places are generally related to the caring economy. Practices, practices, are, practices that reproduce perhaps that, that particular situation, that status quo. So we really need to look at hiring and promotion evaluation, performance management, performance in education, performance in academics, partnering and care. So again, as I said, there's a lot that casts us in particular caring, um, caring positions and give us more of the workload at home. I think this was showed um, very much in, in, a, in the keynote speak presentation. And then there are two, sexual harassment and gender-based violence, at least in our region in Latin America, considered to be one of the major barriers for women to be able to advance. Next, please. So we have um, a quite broad outlook on how we run our programs for women and science in the British Council. We want to inspire young women. We want to support women through networks. We want to run mentorship schemes. And we want to do that 
throughout the life cycle, you know, of, 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 a, of a woman's of a woman's career and a woman's life. So we call this the life cycle approach. Next, please. And here we will take just a peek of the life cycle approach. So if you see, we, we do that since childhood, but if you look here, we have from postgraduate taught until mid-career established, we have several types of interventions that the British Council can work with, together with our partners because we don't do anything with our partners. We always do in partnership that we can support women as they go along. And also institutions who are receiving and being you know, responsible for, for those women entering the system. We also support them. So if you could go next, please. And next. So this is just another example of a timeline. And here are some examples of activities. So we work with policy briefs. We have Women in Science magazine, have social media campaigns. We also have partnerships with UK universities, UK institutions, such as the Athena Swan Partnership, which will support women around the world to network. And next. Here are some of the examples I just mentioned. You can see our beautiful Women in Science magazine. This one, this version is in Spanish, but we have in English and Portuguese. Next, and I'll go into the STEM scholarships program. So this is one of our interventions, which we believe is absolutely exciting. It's a new one. We started last year. And last year, we have 118 scholars going from different regions to the UK. Nine women were traveling with children. One of the major points for our program is to actually reach women who otherwise would not be able to, would not be able to, to go and study abroad and many times not be able to study a master's degree at all. So that's why we are so proud of this program because it has helped us to reach women and get them a chance to be in STEM fields that they wouldn't have or advance their studies that they wouldn't have otherwise. Next, please. So these are our scholars I've already mentioned. You can see where they're coming from. So we have East Asia, South Asia, and the Americas region participating in the program. These are the countries that are represented. We want to add more countries if we have the right partners. So the idea is to have many more scholars build a movement, but we need more partners to do that. Next. These are the fields that women, and another click please. These are the fields that women have available to choose from. Most of the time, you can see kind of the, the high level and then the detail, and I'll go next. And this is, you know, we have master's degree, so I'll go through because my time is up, so very quickly. These are the master's cohorts. These are the, the, the countries. Women from these countries will be available, will be, will be eligible, sorry, will be eligible to apply. We are going to make this available, this opportunity available for women in December. So it's going to be very exciting and we invite everyone to help us promote the scholarship schemes. Please, next. Next, I'll just go through this. And this is another scheme which is only available to the Asian region, which is called the Early Academic Fellowship Grants. This is to advance research, it's a very short scheme to advance research and research collaboration researchers going to the UK to advance their um, their research projects in, in collaboration with universities in their countries and in the UK. You can see here more or less how much that, that, that scheme costs individually and in total. And the next, please. Next, and this is my last slide. So we just have two public calls. First, we partner with successful UK universities. We're going to be announcing in December which universities are going to be opening up for our master's and fellowship schemes. And then we promote with the individual women when we make sure that they have the enough support to be able to apply. So this is me for now. Thank you, Mitzi. Thank you, Dr. Morse. Wow, excellent uh, initiatives once again from the British Council. And I thank you so much for staying up or waking up early, 3 a.m. there. Really ex excellent insights. We really needed you here. Thank you for, for taking the time out to do that. It's really such meaningful and pioneering work uh, and, and, and how interesting to understand the, the case there in the LAC region. And it's, it's really shocking to see that the uh, table you showed of the situation in Brazil, really how the, the gap uh, just widens um, the further you go. So I look forward to talking more about that later. But for now, uh, I'd like to ask you about um, um, an issue related to concerns of uh, talent outflow. So they call it brain drain sometimes, you know, when scholarship recipients 
Uh, they often seek jobs abroad because of poor research conditions in their home countries. Again, usually with um, developing world uh, countries. What, what do you think about this issue? What, what policies would you say are most helpful or, or what would you recommend to make sure that these talents return to their countries? No, thank you. That's, I think that's a very important question. And for us, we, you know, we work with mobility, the British Council, we, we are experts in, in mobility and we absolutely believe in internationalism. We absolutely believe in giving young people an international outlook. So we need to be concerned about this issue. Now, from a program perspective, this particular program, the STEM, um, the, the scholarships in STEM for, for women around the world, when we looked into that, we actually made a call to not mandatorily or not oblige women to go back. No, we absolutely considered this topic and how did we address them then? We addressed in two ways. One, our application does require women to kind of talk about their connections to their home country, how they want to support that particular home country development. So it's a very big part of their application and also evaluation of how they are going to grade in that particular application. Another way that we do that is perhaps talking about opportunities for support. And I think this is something very important for policy. It's not only one year in the UK, it's not only the one year scholarship. What are the support mechanisms? One, to support policy development locally. So the local development of that sector so that opportunities are there when our, you know, these particular scholars go back. But also how we give our scholars support so they can choose widely, they can choose amongst uh, many opportunities. One is perhaps further their, their studies in the UK. And that's why we are not obliging them to go back immediately after. But the second would be network in terms of alumni. We, we also have activities that will get scholars together so that they can have enough network, enough support, peer support to continue in that journey, even when they go back to their countries. Thank you, Camila. Very important. That's all part of your life cycle approach, I guess. I love that approach because it's true. Often, you know, you feel alone. You're, you're, you're alone already in your research. And then when it ends, you're just, it's done. That's so important that you get this experience in your other countries so you can bring back more to your motherland or your country. So thanks for that. It, 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 we cannot stress enough the, important of men, the, the significance of mentorship and support, as you said, with your alumni, with your peers and, um, you know, others that you meet to create this very important, to, to maintain also this uh, very important network. Thank you very much, Dr. Morish. Now, let me uh, call on Angela Chen, co-founder of Esquelabs, an online data upskilling school in Southeast Asia. Prior to founding Esquelabs, Ms. Chen was a co-founding member of an impact investing firm focused on sustainable food production in emerging markets. She will talk about women entrepreneurs and technology, specifically how to support women for employment in the IT and technology sector. I look forward to hearing your own story too, Angela, as CEO of digital technology of a C of a digital technology enterprise. Great, thank you so much, Michi, and thank you to the ADB Education Group for inviting us. So Esquabs is an impact-focused startup upskilling Filipino workers in data science and data analytics skills. And we started the company based on a core belief that those with data skills will succeed in the future of work. So during the pandemic, what your job was affected uh, how you and your family were impacted. So here we contrast two personas created based on the data from Drop Street Philippines on the most and the least affected workers during the pandemic in 2020. So here on the right side, you can see that tech workers were resilient as compared to those who worked in traditional service sectors. And unfortunately, we already know that women were more likely to be in the service sector and in non-tech jobs as compared to men. But already before the pandemic, companies already reported difficulty in hiring talent with digital skills. And we're expecting that to exacerbate as economies digitize. So what are the solutions that a worker might have to improve their skills and move towards tech if they are uh, not already in school and don't have access to some of the resources that the previous panelists mentioned? So first, they can try self-paced online courses like Coursera, or they can try to become a developer through coding boot camps. While the former has low completion rates of 3% on average, the latter has a high price tag and a higher barrier to entry for those not coming from a STEM background. 
And so we already know that women are underrepresented in STEM fields, right, which serve as a pipeline into these boot camps. So the problem Esclabs wanted to solve is to democratize the exciting opportunities in the digital economy through innovating on technical vocational education. And we decided to focus on data analytics and data science because they were accessible for workers from different backgrounds who have been underserved and underrepresented uh, in past tech jobs. So we believe data skills will empower workers to ask the right questions, communicate with evidence and make informed decisions. And this might include leveraging tools like Power BI and SQL, which is more inclusive than just focusing on learning how to code in order to become a software engineer. And unlike existing alternatives, we focus on active, online, and cohort-based learning. So that lowers the cost compared to traditional education, but improves the outcomes and the experience as compared to self-paced online learning. And so we started with the job outcome in mind. So far, we've partnered with more than 120 companies across industries to hire upskillers in data. And, uh, here in the next slide, you can see our past results, which show that 90% of upskillers are placed within 90 days, where they experience on average a 50% salary increase from our data science cohorts. I'm also proud to share that currently for every 1.1 male learner at Esclabs, we have one female learner. So today I wanna to talk to you about how our work relate to the topic uh, the, uh, at the Gender Forum. And I wanna highlight three main questions that you uh, might also have. So the first one is, why do we need more women in data roles? Um, how do we attract more women to learn data skills? And how can we create women-friendly learning environments for STEM? So the first one is uh, quite obvious, um, but I think there's a very specific aspect of data that we need to talk about. So algorithms are now involved in decisions big and small in our lives, right? So from everything like what we see in our social media feed, all the way to whether or not we might be approved for a loan. Um, but the fact is that, well, 50% of the population are women, as low as only 15% of data professionals globally who build these algorithms are women. And these algorithms are susceptible to bias. So building them will require a team that's diverse. So for instance, when a recruiting AI was built by Amazon, it trained on data of past hires, which were majority men. And that led the algorithm preferring male candidates and penalizing applicants which, um, who had words on their resumes that associated them with women. So for instance, um, a graduate from Silk Mill Women's University might be downgraded by this algorithm. And I'm pretty sure Dr. Chang might not be very happy about that. So this unfortunately perpetuates perceptions that hold back gender equality. And so in order to get more women into these fields who did not study STEM previously, we need them to be upskilled after they enter the labor market. So luckily we did see an increase of women indicating interest in upskilling post pandemic. In the Philippines, for instance, uh, which topped the highest growth in new women learners on Coursera, that increase occurred in the same year when the freelancer supply of the country also topped the global list as more job opportunities were found online. And Filipinas already made up 60% of all freelancers in the country prior to the pandemic. So this shift towards online jobs coupled with upskilling can be a crucial way to create a pathway for women to participate in the future of work. And that makes sense because remote work done at home could fit into the busy schedule of women who have childcare and household duties. So um, through our user research with Filipinas, we hear them say things like, I want to have an awesome job, but I care about my child more and I need to put my family first. So we think freelancing work opportunities could give women a chance to potentially balance those different priorities. So for us to scale up our impact for these learners, Esclabs recently launched a new partnership with the Australian government and FH Moms, which is the country's largest women freelancing network with close to 350,000 women. And so the goal of the partnership is to provide women freelancers with data analytics skills to improve their employability in online jobs. And taking a page out of our existing programs, first we started by analyzing the job types in the online freelancing market that women access currently. So we review the job descriptions to understand what exactly are the skills needed. 
And then we were able to create learning outcomes which are linked to the largest group of job types. And ultimately, having a demand-driven approach would ensure the learning is always tied to job outcomes. So now let me walk you through some of the key features of this unique learning experience. So through this initiative, we're leveraging a mobile-based data literacy course, which will reach at least 10,000 women in the next 18 months. Accessing it via phone is very important because we know access to laptops is another big constraint. We also know that having community is very important important, so our freelancers will be learning in groups of four. They'll be grouped uh, using their schedule availability, which we know is important to them, and the group will go through case studies together um, and learn by doing. We designed the content um, of these cases to be women-friendly and on topics that they are interested in. And this is in contrast, I think, um, to anyone who's tried to learn STEM through um, more of the recent digital platforms that many of the cases are on topics like sports or, you know, online gaming, things that maybe, you know, boys and men would be more interested in. Learners, um, as I mentioned earlier, would just need to access their mobile phone to access the content and also to join the live sessions, which occurs once a week. They can also use a chat function to answer questions together while going through the program. So now I'll attempt to see if I can do a quick demo of how case studies are actually being used to mimic the on-the-job training. For that, I will need to share a new screen. And let me just stop, sh stop sharing and share again. Okay, there we go. Okay, so here in this demo, you can see how each woman will be assigned a role in the group. And when all the team members have joined, the case will begin. The case studies are based on mock assignments given to freelancers and are based on tasks like interpreting sales data of a client. So learners can work on the task on their own or with a group through the chat. So here you can see that they're learning um, about data visualization and how to interpret graphs. At the end of the case, they can also join community events, which are the live discussion sessions. All right. Okay. Switching back now to the slide. Okay, so that was a very quick demo, um, but really very quickly in summary, we need more women to become the creators of algorithms and not just the consumers of them in order to build gender equality into that digital future. And to achieve that, we need to create more targeted upskilling solutions for women who are already in the workforce. So we hope to be a valuable contributor to this space for years to come. And if you'd like to collaborate with us, um, feel free to reach out to us here or my email, which is Angela at esclabs.com. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angela. Very important point there regarding these uh, biases and algorithms. I think not many people are, are aware of that, at least not the general public. So there's really a lot of education we have to do in that regard. Now, I'd like to ask you about, I guess, with all these trainees that you have, for example, with this excellent um, data liter literacy skill course, what are your thoughts on uh, looking at trainees, helping women trainees find a job after training. So say they take this skill course or whatever course uh, any other uh, group might offer, voc vocational training programs. How can you ensure that these trainees find a job after? How can we make sure we uh, connect them, these programs connect them to real world employability? Yeah, there are two ways I think um, our philosophy really ensures that happens. So the first one, as I mentioned, is we develop the curriculum in line with what the industry need is. Um, so one of the other things that we do that we didn't get to mention in the presentation is we actually build our own AI job model where we scrape job sites like JobStreet, Indeed, and Caliber, uh, which are popular job sites in the Philippines and in the, re uh, in, in the region. And we um, parse through the text of the job script uh, the job description to understand what are the skills that are being asked for for certain jobs. And we match um, as well uh, some of the 
maybe nuances in local job market demand. So for instance, uh, for these data roles, let's say if you wanted to go into a data analyst position in Singapore, uh, learning Python as a coding language uh, is basically a requirement that shows up in most job postings. However, in the Philippines, uh, which has a very strong BPO sector and serves, uh, let's say, international clients, U.S. companies, uh, a very similar job title uh, for the role of data analyst um, may ask, actually require a different set of skills. So we consider those nuances uh, in being able to develop the curriculum. So that's that's what I mentioned earlier. Even with the freelancers, we had to redo that exercise because now these jobs are actually global. They're not just local companies hiring locally. They're global companies that are hiring anybody in the world who can step up and do, do those jobs. The second thing um, that I mentioned quickly is we work directly with the companies who are looking for these types of talent um, to build that pathway directly into hiring. And from the company perspective, um, it's a partnership with, with them. It's very attractive for them because um, they, they're already facing high cost of hires for these high-skilled um, jobs, yeah. And so by providing directly um, our, our uh, graduates into those companies, um, they can lower their cost of hire and our graduates uh, don't have to go out there and go through the arduous like job application process that somebody might typically have to go through. Um, we also have something like um, what we call a job interview guarantee with companies that uh, really provide, I think, our education with a stamp of approval. Because of course, you know, when you are innovating on this education process, um, you need to have uh, credibility and credentials. And oftentimes our learners are not going to these companies with, you know, a master's degree, right, in data science, uh, which they cannot afford. Um, but by companies working with us and saying, Anybody who comes from S Labs, we will um, be open to giving them a first round interview. That actually directly provides the value that learners are looking for through education, which is opening up the door to more opportunities. That's the ultimate value of education. And if we can create a very uh, interesting bespoke structure uh, where the industry wins, the educator wins, um, then you know that that's a that's an innovative way of being able to do that. Thank you, Angela. Wow, that's a great environment you guys have uh, created there. And um, it's good to know that this is available now. And also there's a lot of work there because the environment is constantly changing. Uh, so you have to update these programs, I imagine. So we have some questions coming into the chat. We'll ask them later during the open question and answer session. For now, uh, we will move on to our final presentation from Alexander Tsironis education specialist at the ADB, specializing in technical and vocational education and training with a focus on work-based training. He will talk about inspiring women to excel in technology, specifically through an exemplary IT TVET program that empowers women. He will also delve into the role of the private sector and collaboration in this regard. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. Yes, uh, I hope you can see my screen in the slides. I assume so, I will go ahead. So today I will talk about inspiring women to excel in technology careers in TVET, a project design perspective. Project design perspective, of course, because the ADB works mostly with projects and that's interesting to see how we approach it in terms of this. Okay, first I wanna ask the question, uh, is there really a gender gap in, in tech jobs? And the answer is obviously very clearly, you can see it here, the orange part shows um, women in technical professions. The answer is yes, it's a, not even a gap, it's probably a gap crisis if you want. So this is from Germany and it shows these data points from Germany to show it's actually, it's not an Asian problem where we say, oh, what's Asia doing here? It's, it's a global problem, definitely. And just to, to focus on the professions that, that were selected here, um, this ranges from very normal TV professions, electricians and mechatronics, to engineer positions, and then to the um, software and web developer IT professions. So this is kind of almost promising that the new professions, the web developer is on 20%, and the older professions, the engineers, is still below 10%. But obviously, these numbers are not enough in any case, wherever that is. Um, now to the question of why is there the skill gaps? And the thing is, there's, uh, there are many reasons, and we know this. And, but when there are many reasons, there are also many solutions. So it's, it's in this sense, it's promising. We recently done a kind of a brief mapping of the factors and divided them into uh, societal factors, 
which are social norms, also public policy factors, personal factors, which are individual, but also on the family side, and institutional factors. So we looked at TVETs, so we look at TVETs side as well as the labor market side. I'm going to show you now the, the factors, the many uh, bullet points. It's not for you really to read through them. It's just to, to give a sense of, in terms of project design, we could address all these different points, right? The, the challenge is quite big if you want to address it holistically. Uh, not, not, not a single project will not be able to do this, but just to kind of show that uh, it's a big spectrum to, to be working on here. Okay, now I wanted to look at an ADB project example. So the, we have an ADB TVET project in Tajikistan, and the key focus of this project was to make non-traditional occupations gender accessible. So professions that are non-traditionally taken by women. So this includes digital professions as well as no, um, normal, technical, um, engineering professions. And we uh, went into four areas to address this issue, which I wanted to, to present Right, and this relates to what I've shown earlier. So in terms, first we look at the education inputs, the classical education inputs and the learning material. I and mean, you start by making uh, the learning material gender sensitive as well as the curricula. And the classic examples, of course, the, the textbooks are full of um, visualizations of men with helmets pointing at whatever is being taught, but it's always men in the pictures. This is a very classic case. And this is about making textbooks um, see women as well, so that women can see themselves or girls can see themselves in the textbooks. Um, the other factors is capacity building of teachers, gen gender sensitivity training, and also a somewhat surprising one is assessors that I don't think of immediately is to increase the number of female assessors because even this can be a barrier uh, for girls or can be intimidating. So even these factors can be looked into. On the second factor of infrastructure, uh, this is somewhat surprising to some extent. Um, in many TVET schools, uh, girls stay in dormitories, and these are not often not gender sensitively built. So again, this is a very classical barrier where a girl might say, yes, this is fine, but I cannot imagine staying in this dormitory. I, I don't want to go to that TVET school. And so uh, even these things that we wouldn't think of immediately uh, also need to be looked at. And this is, in this case, is infrastructure. This project also had incentive. Uh, providing stipends for women in non-traditional TVET to, to, to incentivize women or girls to get into non-traditional TVET uh, programs and also address social norms through mostly PR campaigns, awareness raising campaigns, but also gender competitions. But there's also one, one thing I, uh, I like to say about awareness raising campaigns because it's one of the first acts we always think of. Ah, we just have to tell girls that this is a great career choice. But if the things above are not done, so if the environment has not been created, that it's actually a comfortable learning environment for a girl, we shouldn't be advertising it, basically. And that's really a key takeaway, that this, this, is, this is a package that we have to be uh, providing. Awareness uh, campaigns alone will not do it. So the key takeaway from this is um, whatever the, the market says or wherever the digital transformation will go, investing into the fundamentals, and that is creating an attractive learning environment for girls at schools, will always be essential. And this is what uh, many ADB projects do and actually mean when we say we do gender mainstreaming, that's what's behind it. Okay, uh, now I'm gonna skip a little bit to another issue in, uh, in, in the TVET sector and on women and girls, and that's the growing importance of adult education. And this comes from the observation that women are more strongly affected by industry 4.0 than men in terms of job displacement. And here I have an example. Th these are the projected anticipated losses of jobs in the garment sector in Cambodia. The blue one is the, the males. These are totals. And the yellow bar uh, indicates uh, women. And you can see 420% more women will lose, uh, are anticipated to lose their jobs because of uh, the digital transformation. And this is just to show um, where the next policy priority lies. This will happen. Tr structural economic transformations are normal, but there must be systems in place to, uh, to provide for adult learners, adult women, uh, give them retraining and upskilling chances. And this is a project I want to uh, highlight from actually from Germany. And there's one specific part I want to highlight, which we heard in the previous uh, presentation in a different form is interesting. Uh, but let's, let me talk about it. So this is uh, in Germany, there is a program that focuses on reskilling on long term unemployed women in, uh, in Germany. It's called I'm Simple Digital. That's just the name of it. And it's a citywide project. And this is a this is also a start of an observation that doesn't always need to be a, a na national wide project. Cities can do this within their own uh, city economy. And this is financed through public social fund. 
And it kind of has these three components of all projects should have in place. And I think Angela kind of touched on it. It should have career advice, education, and uh, the transition to the labor market, right? The labor market, the integration part. So it's kind of the holy trinity of, of TV, if you like. And this project had all this in place. So um, the career guidance in terms of the job agency, so these long-term unemployed women would go to the job agency and they would be made feel familiar with the approach. Why don't you try to go into the tech or digital sector? The, the, this was followed by five weeks digital and employability skills training. And I have to say, this wasn't uh, high, high end digital. These were very basic skills in terms of um, Excel, MS Teams, project management software. But this is to lower the barrier from women to stay, first of all, stay in the program and finish it quicker. And finally, after these five, five weeks, um, there was a fixed placement that was promised uh, in small and medium-sized enterprises in Germany for five weeks. And here, here is the key, and this is why I would want to highlight it with this example is um, obviously we have to go beyond trainings. And in this case, invite SMEs to it. And this wasn't, in fact, a double, a double win because these local SMEs in that city uh, struggled themselves with the, the, the digitalization. So they were most happy to have these uh, women come to their uh, business, basically, and transform it digitally one way or the other, even if it's on a basic level or sometimes advanced level. And creating this core benefit between uh, the private sector and this kind of social uh, upskilling program. So I think a very nice design element. So um, the takeaway from this one is just to go beyond skills and the key is a labor market transition and to go also cross-sectoral beyond education. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Alexander, for clearly outlining there the various challenges and um, uh, opportunities uh, for, for women, I mean, in, uh, basically in this, in this sector. Um, my question to you is related now to, uh, I guess, sorry, let me pull it up here. I, it's, it's more about the, um, the role of the private sector. So you explained great programs that ADB is running. Um, how, wh wh there are many challenges of working with government, right? And oftentimes uh, people just rely on the private sector more, but how, what would you say is really the private sector role in this regard? And how can the government work together with the private sector to, to put up successful programs? Uh, to implement gender equality in education and the uh, ITT vet programs. Yeah, thank you. That's that's definitely the key question to to the whole uh, TVET agenda. I think I would start with the government side because actually I think the government has to go has to make the first step. The government has to make it easy for the private sector to join any such initiatives. And one case, Angela mentioned it already. Um, ask the private sector first what they want to see in a curriculum. And once they see their demand in the curriculum, they will take any student coming out of any program because that's what they actually need in terms of uh, workforce development. The second part is, of course, uh, if you have adult education and you deal with, with um, long-term unemployed who would probably never let a job again in a sense because the market would look at the CV and say, yeah, what happened in the last 10 years, not much, um, that the government is aware of this and has these support programs in place, um, be it uh, paid work placement, subsidies, that make the uh, private sector even more willing and trusting into such programs. On the private sector side, it's definitely the first thing what they have to do is to show up to the debate. And okay, they need to be indicted, but they need to show up uh, to, to the partner schools and, to, and in, at the policy dialogue in a meaningful way. And once they're there, they can, they can make requests that they should ask for this diversity when it comes to gender. And they should then also implement diversity. In the context of our uh, developing countries, it's a bit, little bit ask, a lot asked for from small and medium-sized enterprises to have this whole diversity agenda on, on, on the radar because that's an issue that's a big corporate America. We always hear about the diversity programs. So also would be a starting point to start with the big employers who, who have a dedicated HR department and that, that they make the start. Okay, stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. Perhaps I'll ask you to expound a little more. I'll, I'll move on now to the questions that are coming in uh, from our audience. I, I, I'm not sure who this is addressed to, but some of many of you can answer this, but I'll ask you first, Alexander, since we're with you. It's from A, who is this? AU. What are the challenges you encountered? Well, this is more for the online STEM program for women, but I, I imagine there are many challenges as well for your program. Can you talk about some of the key challenges you've faced? In our specific, uh, I don't know which program I should refer to right now. ITP vet, yeah. Um, okay, the, the, the challenge is, is definitely, 
actually get, getting the, um, the the Tibet sector up to speed because there are also so many different things where the Tibet sector is, is just slow or not, not much invested in because it's not the most popular education sector. And getting uh, the, the, the teacher's capacity first and getting what I said earlier, we first have to build that, that conducive learning environment uh, for girls and women before we can really say, um, advertise it to women with a good conscience, right? I think this is the challenge that uh, we, we match uh, the quality of the uh, TV sector with, with career promises for girls. Yes, thank you. Alexander, I think, can I ask Camilla as well to answer this question? This may have been pertaining to your program as well, the British Council program. Yes, I think there is one point, which is to make sure that the programs that we are designing are actually catering for, for particular private sector demands, for example. So I think consulting from the start, including that on the gender, you know, the gender analysis, that is very important. But I think the second thing is, is to work beyond, is also working from a particular viewpoint of citizenship. So how women and girls can participate fully uh, in, in economic and political life. And in my view, that will give them a chance to participate in whatever sector, be it in academics or the TV sector, in a much more effective way. Thank you very much, Camilla. I see that there are two questions here that were answered, but Maybe they already answered one was, uh, well, there's the latest one is from Darlene to Angela. Perhaps, Angela, you can share some of um, just the points that you answered in uh, the chat box here. The question from Darlene to Angela is, for the women who were badly affected and still being affected by the pandemic and thinking about shifting their career, how does Esquel Labs or similar institutions help them to get back to the workforce or at least encourage them to take that first step? Perhaps you can share some of what you answered there in the chat box. Yeah, no problem, Michi. So I, I think the first thing is um, women are sometimes selecting themselves out of these opportunities. And so one of the things that I think Alexander mentioned is definitely a practice that we, uh, we are very conscious of is always making sure that materials represent um, women and they can see themselves in those roles. Um, that really matters in being able to visualize <laughs> you having those opportunities. And so, yeah, I think the first thing for us is like the, the awareness part of, and, and, and really just uh, being able to communicate um, these opportunities in a way that women can relate to. So as I mentioned uh, earlier, like in our curriculum, for instance, like we attract women to the program by making the topics friendly to them. Maybe it's about like BTS, for instance, which, mm -hmm. You know, from we knew that they were all interested in this topic <laughs> and that got them uh, interested to just start to learn. Um, and I think the second thing is definitely like the um, ability to pay uh, is an issue. Yeah. And so um, being able to overcome that with a model like is, is that the government um, subsidizing? Is it a, a partnership model with a private se sector that subsidizes that? Um, ultimately, we don't uh, at this point, yeah, want to put the burden of being able to pay for that uh, just on the learner, as is always the case in, in TVET. I'm sure Alexander can attest to that as who pays. Is it the government taking care of its citizen? Is it companies uh, investing in its employees or it's the learner who is going to personally benefit from that? And I think now it's we're not in the moment where we want to put that burden on the learners. So as much as possible, if um uh, platforms, educators who are doing this work can find uh, creative, innovative sources of funding uh, to create that value. I think that would be, um, yeah, really, uh, really necessary. Exactly. I think creative is the key word there. Just as you, uh, you know, bring in topics like BTS, you have to be creative about the, uh, making the learners want to learn and also supporting them. I want to bring up this question uh, from Thelina Madiwala, which was addressed to Wira Stuti, although you answered this uh, in the chat, but I want to bring up the one question because it, it seems to be very important for this discussion. Perhaps you can share your answer, Wira Stuti. The question to how did you tackle the patriarchal mindset of some university administrators and academics, including career guidance counselors who do not recognize the importance of promoting women's participation in technology education? Yeah, well, uh, thank you, Miki. Uh, Missy. 
Um, I, uh, I mentioned in the chat room that this is a good uh, quest, uh, question because I still experience that, even though UGM is one of the best universities in Indonesia. But when we, especially because I'm working in a, a department of uh, in a geographic information science, like most of the lecture there is uh, male. And they still consider that, uh, you know, like the, for the leadership and the, for the position for uh, the important and very strategic position, it should be a man that uh, can lead uh, the group or the community. So I still could not find the exact answer, but like I mentioned, the chart, uh, chart from the education, I think uh, that's the, the best way uh, and the key to uh, promote yourself that. Uh, this is me. Uh, this is the woman that we have uh, like same uh, opportunity to assess a uh, higher education, and we are able to prove that um, in this field we are able to also deliver the same quality and the same standard that it can deliver from the other. Uh, like if working together, actually we can deliver like a much more. Uh, what is it like? Uh, like a perfect a uh, result, and uh, also you know like. Actually, having a woman in the group of a uh, very technological uh, like community uh, uh, can bring like a sense of um, what is it? I call it like the family and togetherness and also care among the group. And I think, I think the most the most important that we should uh, raise of like more bring the humanity aspect rather than proving that this is me. I'm able to do the technology thing that. Still, that's uh, really difficult for them to accept that. But uh, like bringing up the humanity that, you know, we have to respect each other as a group, as a community, as family. I think that's the um, uh, different aspect that we have to raise that are using that as a different way, you know, like to change the mindset of the patriarchy among the community, especially in Indonesia. Yes, I think that's very very well said. Very important. Thank you for bringing that up. Humanity, sometimes behind the screen and digital, you know, we lose. It's so cold. Yeah. We lose that that humanity, right? So just mm-hmm. be kind, and then yes. remember that we are interacting with humans, and you know, it's all about making connections, right? Thank you sure. very much. There is another question here from AU uh, to. Uh, well, let's see who would like to take this first. Please let me know. Or maybe you can raise your hand who'd like, among the panelists who would like to answer this. In some past interventions for women empowerment, the disruption of the familial power dynamics led to women participating in programs becoming violence against women victims. Are you observing similar situations today or has the Philippine culture improved? I, I suppose this can also apply to your respective areas, uh, your, your regions, not just in the Philippines. Um, who would like to take this? Sorry, let me see. I cannot see the raising. Which uh, Camilla, I see you. Yes, Camilla, go ahead. Uh, I'll just start because this is a very this is a very big topic. Like for example, from our perspective, safeguarding of whoever participates in our programs it is a very big issue. So absolutely, when you were talking about vulnerable populations and many of the women that we want to reach are women who are vulnerable. You need to go a step forward to kind of analyze what is the risk of that woman, for example, of you know, participating in something and that, that could turn around. So we absolutely all need to look at the do no harm principle in everything that we do. And I think the gender analysis tool, when you are starting a project, if you run a gender analysis, those risks, you know, whether someone has a, a home that's not safe, so, for example, now with online learning, that's related to another uh, question in the chat. But now that we have a lot of online learning, that actually exacerbates the, the risk for women who don't have a safe space at home to have to take that course and stay more hours. So safeguarding is a major issue. There are several tools that we can use to kind of make sure that we look at those risks, we mitigate those risks to prevent that from happening. But sometimes it's just inevitable. And then you need to be able to support. You have to have support systems to do something about it because that's very much uh, the reality sometimes. Thank you, Camila. There's another question that just came in very much related to what you just discussed from Thelina Madiwala again. Uh, How do you encourage employers and universities to adopt and implement anti-sexual harassment policies which will contribute to increased participation of women in technology. Now I, I can take this very, very, you know, very briefly <laughs> if to the other. I, I think from, you know, from our perspective, partnering with the universities from the start is really important. And then looking with the universities at what's happening, you know, it's the walk the talk kind of thing. So looking what's happening in our own backyard, what are the risks that is happening and then what we need to do. And those particular policies are fundamental and they will be only first steps. 
because there are several things that will come in the way of policy implementation. So how you revisit the reproduction of, of stereotypes, for example, university campus, how you make sure that the debate and the safe spaces are open. So this is all part of the policy framework, but it's also part of a new culture that together is people implementing projects, opening up opportunities institutionally can actually help and incentivize universities to do. Thank you very much, Camila. Angela May, Colin, you maybe you can share your perspectives being a CEO in a male-dominated field, no, in the IT sector, related to the previous question I asked. Do you remember? Would you like me to ask? Yeah. That again. So I, it was basically I, I, yeah. with, um, women empowerment and the you know stereotypes you face. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. So I, I think really it takes um, and this is really I think a real life case study of why we need more women in leadership, because if somebody who is a leader has gone through these challenges, they understand why it's important to set in these safeguards in place. So I think for us, we um, even include in the learner contracts that we have um, with learners in our programs, uh, something that is a anti-harassment uh, policy that we educate them on. And it, it, it is uh, built specifically with that in mind of being able to create an inclusive environment for all learners uh, and not even just on the lines of gender. On the aspect, I think on the employer side, which is quite interesting, um, is from the freelancing um, perspective, we are also looking into how we could educate our women freelancers on their rights as freelancers. Uh, right, because as I think remote work becomes the norm, there's actually a lack of norms of what it, what are appropriate ways of working and uh, what are the types of ways that uh, foreign employee, often often cases foreign employers could engage uh, with Filipino women who are in um, th these freelancing uh, roles in in these gig roles. So that's also something that we are yeah considering of how that could actually extend into the career support that we would be pr providing to them. Thank you, Angela. There's a question here for Alexander, which I see you also answered, but I'd like to add to this question, Alexander, so I'll call on you next. The question from Felina again is, how did you tackle gender stereotyping mindsets among some employers who provide non-traditional or traditionally male-led employment to women? So in connection to this, I'd like to add just a little more uh, to get your perspective on this as well, how um, uh, I guess looking at uh, the, the digital transformation and these cultural biases that, uh, that are, uh, in, I guess, in, embedded in them. Well, there, there's research that has revealed that some applications based on machine learning have been found to replicate the social biases which are fed into them. So this goes into, um, you know, basically these are mostly biases around gender. So how can these processes or even the programs for STEM training and ITT, but how can they be improved so as not to perpetuate these gender biases? And who is really responsible for this oversight? Should it be the government or should it be technology companies or, or who should be overseeing the technological change that the world is experiencing to make sure we're, we're, we're uh, looking at the ethics, the ethical side of it? It's a very big question. I think I will not be able to answer this sufficiently. Uh, maybe on the on the on the on the answer from uh, of the question from the chats, um, how to overcome the biases within uh, among employers, and this is the thing. This is where the the government uh, doesn't have the reach anymore, right? It cannot force the private sector. The private sector does its own thing. It's in its own in its own realm. Of course, there are always policies uh, can be in place of gender equality at, at the workplace, and it's important. But the implementation is still a long way. And especially among smaller SMEs, if there's a bias among, uh, let's, let's say, for something very basic, a plumber uh, company, how, how, how do you address this? Um, in our programs, we, we do train, for example, in company trainers. This is mostly for the quality of the in-company workplace training. But part of this training also, also always has a gender sensitivity training with it. So the, the in-company trainer who has the closest contact with the trainee is sensitized already. This is kind of a, a key thing. Another thing is, of course, uh, putting grievance uh, mechanisms into place. So if something happened, this can be addressed. But this is not just to be punitive. This is actually a, a way to start a dialogue the, with, the, with the company and say, ah, this is how we, we don't look at this like this. And there's a learning process behind it. It's not just to say, oh, you've, you've done bad, bad, bad company. So there's a learning process. Uh, and the last thing is called uh, support female entrepreneurship. That's kind of the avoidance strategy. If we feel like um, there's no winning with employers, uh, the other strategy is to say, of course, let's, let's uh, empower really uh, women to do their own thing and do the female entrepreneurship and put the funds into place. Let them start their own companies, their own uh, sessions, uh, their own uh, digital 
with labs. And these are kind of the key uh, strategies. In terms of societal norms, um, I think there's definitely the role of government to support the big initiatives and put this, this issue out there. And one key mechanism that's always off the lo- overlooked, this last point, I promise, is actually business associations that represent uh, many businesses. They have that little cloud and that, that, that reach. And if government funds uh, gender activities going through via these uh, business associations and business membership organizations, there's a good chance that this is actually a good channel. Thank you very much, Alexander. Great points. Definitely very important, this gender-sensitive training. This is something maybe that should even be included in schools. Uh, And uh, so we we have time for just one last question that I'd like to ask each of you. Um, Building on that question I I threw into Alexander earlier, looking at ethics, basically because it's so hard to control this online world now, right, with the internet of things and this this revolution. It's a borderless world. So I'm looking at what ethical practice looks like, because really this discussion or looking at gender inclusivity, it's not just about, uh, it's not just uh, about people who are technically competent working in, uh, basically it's not getting jobs away from men that should be given to women. It's important that we don't just have people who are technically competent working in roles, but that they also have some sort of training in ethics. So my question is, um, looking at the old normal, but we know that the old normal didn't work and the pandemic proved that. That's why we now have this chance to reboot, to recalibrate. What is one wrong thing from the old normal that you would like to see changed through the fourth industrial revolution, moving into a a post pandemic world? So what is one thing that you think we should urgently change? Let me start with Dr. Widyat Mandi. I see you looking up there. Are you still thinking? Uh, Yes. Or would you like to? Indeed, I'm still thinking. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I think because the disruption of the pandemic really pushed us to, you know, like uh, have to a uh, quick and fast adjustment to this uh, new normal. So hmm, there's a lot of things, I think, uh, not a lot. I think, um, oh, yes, uh, there is step, I think, the readiness and also preparedness to, uh, to set up the mitigation or disruption in education, especially like uh, I think we uh, we have been living in the uh, comfort, the comfortable zone, uh, the comfort zone that we we really not expect that this disruption is going to become really quick. So I think the mitigation or the possibility that uh, possibly will come that affected to all aspects on our life, especially the education or also the factor that really uh, will uh, impact the women uh, like uh, in uh, in the especially the opportunity in engaging more with the work and opportunity to give like more uh, accessibility to uh, improve themselves and contribute uh, their uh, what is it the skill in, in technology especially because uh, of this. Um, I think uh, the the old uh, the old normal uh, what we have been experiencing really uh, put us in the situation that everything is going to be okay. Like you you will be fine. That loud technology that we uh, experience will be ready in the future. And uh, I think that's the the key. Or like mitigation for all the different kind of the disruption. I think we have to really uh, uh, what is it um scrutinize that and thinking what the possibility of the future uh, for different aspects like uh, environment, education, economic and social and different type of aspect. I think the mitigation of that, I think uh, that's the key uh, thing that we have to prepare earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, you said it. Scrutinize. You really have to reflect, look inward again. And definitely preparation is key because this is yeah. not the end of it, right? This may happen again. And we have so many lessons to learn. So thank you for, for those insights. Yeah. Let's go over to Camilla. Your thoughts? Yeah, very quickly, the question, I think we cannot set up ourselves again into the same, you know, reproducing the same digital divide. So that's, we already know, the pandemic has shown. So setting up new models that will exacerbate the digital divide even more, I think would be a big failure for all of us. So we cannot do that. And the second thing is just setting up systems and processes like, for example, flexi work at the workplace that will perhaps exacerbate the role of women at home and actually give the double journey, the triple journey, yet another meaning that would be overburdening women. So I think there's two things would be my, my, my two cents. Thank you very much, Camila. Very important uh, points there. Uh, Angela? Yeah, so I think the question was, what was the one thing I would change, right? Um, yes. It was very difficult to just pick one thing. <laughs> no. One um, of the top ones then that you think. One what, what of the top ones. Yeah. So I think like we are moving in a world, we're moving, I mean, we're already living in a world 
where decision making power um, is going from humans making decisions to machines making decisions. And we're already seeing that now. And there are some aspects of that maybe that's not even seen by us. And we think it's us making the decisions, but it's actually the machines and the algorithms. And so what that means is um, instead of those who have like maybe capital or, you know, traditional means of production having power, it's that those who understand how machines work, those who understand technology, those who can work with data, those are the people who will have power. And ultimately, when it comes to topics like gender equality, it's oftentimes about power structures. And so if we want to give um, if we you know, want to talk about empowering women, uh, then it involves teaching them those technologies. And sorry, I think there's a little bit of noise on my end. Thanks, Michi. That's all right. Thank you very much, Angela. All right, over to you, Alexander. Yeah, uh, I'm not sure if it's keeping or, or getting rid of it. It's the flexible working. I think the flexible working that we had uh, should be definitely kept. And also this relates also of the world of work and how we work digitally, because I think it opens up much more flexibility for, it's again a gender topic for maybe uh, people who have to raise kids, could be also of course men raising kids at home. Uh, but this flexibility to, to work from home and doing other stuff which you cannot avoid. And I think the acceptance, I think there's already quite a wide acceptance uh, shining through throughout the last two years. And I think this should be kept. Yeah. Yes. Well said, definitely we have to move into a more flexible uh, understanding world. Definitely this hybrid environment will, will be something we all have to consider. Thank you very much to our panelists, Wira Stuti, Widyat Manti, Camila Morsh, Angela Chen, and Alexander Tsiranis for opening our minds to these very important topics for a thought-provoking session. Um, all of you have really made it clear that empowering girls and women to enter STEM fields of study and careers and stay the course is so important. And we all have a role to play in this. And this requires holistic and integrated responses that reach across sectors and engage girls and women in identifying solutions to persistent challenges. And as you all pointed out, the government and education institutes, both public and private sectors, must do more to address this gender imbalance. And we really have to look at designing a future that's more inclusive, that considers gender. So as you all, we, we heard it in our discussion today, the education system was challenging enough already Then, for over a year, almost two years now, we've had to deal with the largest disruption of education and history brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. And the pandemic indeed has highlighted the gaps, inequities and failures of education, but the successes have also been highlighted as you've all pointed out. And amidst this crisis, let's focus on the opportunities. I love that message that you all gave. We must focus on the opportunities such as those brought about by the digital transformation where women have a range of options for upskilling in technology. Again, as you all highlighted in, uh, in your presentation. So let's remember this big opportunity that despite, or, or maybe because of the challenges we face today, technology transition is capable of being a force for equality. So we need to work together to nurture brave and innovative women so we can break more glass ceilings, overcome stigma and prejudice, so we can build a better, brighter, more inclusive, equitable, and sustainable world. So thank you again, everyone. Thank you for your attention and active participation today. Uh, see you tomorrow at day three of the Gender Forum. Keep safe and well. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you everyone. Thank you. Um, Joey Meeking, there is a question someone sent me directly. They wanted to know if there will be a recording of this session available. I didn't know what to answer. Selena, actually, will this be available for viewing later? Yes, I think so. We recorded already. Okay. So I, I think we will, we, can, we will share soon. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Rest well. Those of you who are up, you can sleep now. <laughs>